say, where's a cheap place to live? On the other side of the campus. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Pretty awful, ain't it? <laughs> Carpet's all worn out. Curtains are falling to pieces. Honestly, it's the one I had the nerve to show the place. <laughs> Wait to see the view. There. Well, how about the bath? Yeah? The bath. The bath. Oh, the bath. <laughs> Wait a minute, I'll let it sit up. In the morning. <laughs> One, two. You'll be number five. You'll follow Mr. Anderson. And if anybody makes a holler, <laughs> you just say I said so. Thanks. <laughs> well, I guess that's all. <laughs> Good luck to you. And you know, <laughs> just make yourself to home. Come in. Say, aren't you Bevan? Yeah, that's right. Welcome to Autopsy Arms. <laughs> I thought I pegged you when I saw you on the stairs. I'm Bill Anderson. You don't remember me, do you? I'm sorry, your face is familiar, but <laughs> it should be. You stepped on it hard enough. I played tackle at opposite you two years ago in the Midland game. Oh, sure, I remember. Sit down. Thanks. It's swell to see you. Say, there are a lot of good schools where you come from. What brought you way out here? Forster. Oh, boy, he's tough. There's an upperclassman down the hall just telling us. Does he us. know Forster? Yeah, come on out. He sure is laying it right on the line. And that winds up the biology crowd. Fellas, meet Jack Bevan. Hi, hi, hi Jack. Jack. Tell us what you said about Forster. I want Jack to hear it. Duck Forster every chance you get. That's my advice. He's poison in big doses. But the greatest neurological surgeon in the world. My friend, he'd have to be four times as good to make up for what he puts you through. You'll find out. <laughs> He's not kidding. <laughs> What's he gonna do, operate on us? Sit down. This is an operating room, not a ballpark. Since for some obscure reason, known only to yourselves, you have elected to pursue the science of medicine, I trust your delicate sensitivities will not be offended by the sight of a little blood. If they are, you can close your eyes. A practice followed by many of our leading doctors in all their professional work. Though he is unable to acknowledge the introduction at the moment, this is a man named Mason. Actually, his name is Legion, for he is a typical victim of medical incompetence. For 12 years, he's endured treatments for an assortment of maladies, all the results of faulty diagnosis. He also has submitted to four operations, all utterly useless. And all because years ago, in schools like this, there were groups of men like you who were unwilling to face their responsibilities. And you, unless I can prevent it, will go forth to do similar crimes. You'll grow impatient with the long hours here. The drudgery, the screams, the stench. So you'll pop out to do your inferior best than some other William Mason. Years later, he'll be brought to me or some other man who wasn't in such a hurry to hang out his shingle. And an aged and unsuspected tumor will be found in his spinal cord. I don't want you to gather from this that I'm in the least concerned about Mason as an individual. I'm concerned with the fact that his 12 years of agony are due to the sloppiness of medical training, which permits men to go out into the world bearing the title of doctor who know how to do nothing but sit by Mason's bedside twice a week. Look at his tongue, tell him to buck up bravely, and then send him a stiff a bill as they think his pocketbook will stand. The 
with which gesture of respect toward the fellow members of my profession and to you gentlemen who are shortly to join them, I shall now proceed to rectify their mistakes. Already, Doctor. Gentlemen, you doubtless think that no patient will ever go through what Mason has gone through as the result of your particular stupidity. And allow me to assure you that nothing could be further from the truth. You are no different than any other class of beginners in any medical school. Your own opinions to the contrary. Statistics prove that at least 60% of you are so completely dumb that you will be asked to leave for the protection of the general public. Now, 15% of the class will receive diplomas to which they have no actual right. Another 15% will emerge as better than average students and consequently as better than average doctors. By that I mean you will cause less damage than your fellows. Now in the remaining 10%, the top 10%, there's a chance that something of real importance may develop. And it is to you of the top flight that I now speak. For from this small group will come the pure scientist in whose life there is room for nothing but science. Those on the outside will think your lives barren and empty. You on the inside will know that they are rich and full. Because for you there will be accomplishment. Someone Someday will tell us what we want to know about cancer. Someone someday will give us the cure for infantile paralysis. The two men who are to achieve these feats are, if I may venture the prediction, already born. Of course, it may be that they are experienced scientists now on the eve of their discoveries. But it may be that they are students in some medical school. These two men may be in this room, now. As I call your names, you will rise and identify yourselves. William Anderson. Yes, sir. Gentlemen, Mr. Anderson obviously is a candidate for specialization in surgery. Since nature has seen fit to endow him with hands suitable only for stump pulling, you will not allow the elect to pursue a career requiring great delicacy and skill. You may sit down, Mr. Anderson. W. Bain. Here, sir. I see the W does not stand for William. My name is Winifred, Dr. Forrester. Hmm, indeed. And so you have decided to overcome the handicap of your sex and go out to do a man's work. Or do you perhaps see yourself as some ministering angel in white, bringing joy and happiness to those fortunate enough to feel your cool hands upon their fevered brows? Neither, Dr. Forrester. I see no reason why, because I'm a woman, I should not be a good doctor. Miss Bain, you're inclined to be too optimistic. You may sit down. John Wesley Bevan. Kindly stand up, John Wesley, let the congregation see you. I notice, John Wesley, that the college from which you come is a righteous little institution engaged chiefly in the manufacture and disbursement of preachers. You'll be interested to know that we have a standing reward here for any dissection that proves the existence of a soul in the human body. How much is the prize, sir? I shall be glad to sign the check, Brother Bevan and let you fill in the figures. As a son of faith, you doubtless believe in the existence of a hereafter, do you not? Well, it's a theory, sir, that science, so far as I know, hasn't yet disproved. Science concerns itself with facts, Brother Bevan, 
not metaphysics. Yes, sir. You will find no interest here in the churchman's views on anatomy or pathology. I can quite understand that, sir. Any more than a scientist's viewpoint would be of any interest on religion. <laughs> I suspect, Brother Bevan, you will find you have come here by mistake. Rhetoric belongs in the pulpit, not the laboratory. I had always supposed so, sir. Until today. <laughs> <laughs> Quiet! If there's any more of this moronic laughter, I'll dismiss the class. All right, Mr. Bevan. That'll do. For now. Alexander Claxon. Alexander Claxon! Oh, Mr. Bevan, what's it like in that little doghouse? I did kind of open the door for myself, didn't I? Well, move over. We're going to be crowded in there together. Well, you certainly graced the skids for yourself. What'd you answer him back for? I never listened to such guff in my life. Those on the outside may think your life's barren and empty, just because <laughs> he's a dried up. Yes, but he's right. What he said about work. Did you see the way he took out that tumor? Being able to do a thing like that would be worth anything. Hey, wait a minute. That's not doghouse talk. You sound as though you really liked the little heel. Well, liking has nothing to do with it. He happens to be a genius. Personally, I think he's a swine. Don't slam the door. Look, I don't want to seem too inquisitive, but don't you know this is the beginning of the Christmas vacation? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Hello, Bill. And you promised to come home with me? Oh, I meant to call you, Bill. I can't go. Will you stop? You've got to have some relaxation. Come on. Oh, Bill, I'd love to, but... Well, I've been waiting four days to find out how a piece of live tissue reacts when it comes in contact with an erythema dose of x-ray. Forget it. I'll show you how live tissue reacts when it comes in contact with turkey. <laughs> well, I'll take a rain check on that. What are you trying to do? Please, Tubby, you couldn't impress that egomaniac if you won the Nobel Prize. But he's still the greatest surgeon in the world. Oh, you've got a forgiving nature, that's all I can say. After the ride he's handed you. Go on, go on, beat it. You miss your train. Okay. Oh, and I hope you and Tubby have a dandy time together. You can eat each other for Christmas dinner. Hey, where do you think you're going? Stick around. You might learn something. If I get any matter, you're going to find out what happens when a person blows up spontaneously. Well, he's the research man. I'm just a social butterfly. So long. Not going home? Your friend Tubby doesn't believe in holidays. He just slapped four of my drawings back in my face to do over again. Well, what of it if they're not right? He kicked out one of mine yesterday. Look, my fine feathered friend. I'm 22 years old, and I'm a woman, and I haven't been to a dance in four months. I haven't had on an evening dress. I haven't had a kiss or a drink or anything else that a girl might enjoy. And now, well, why couldn't he wait until after the holidays for his old drawings? Well, now, just a minute. You don't have to cry about it. I cry? Don't... Who's crying? Why, he couldn't make me cry if... <laughs> Your unselfish devotion to scientific labor is most commendable. But I would suggest a park bench might offer better facilities for your present type of research. Well, that cooks it. He can take his own course and... Hey, don't do... Stop it up the chimney. As far as I'm concerned, Lincoln just signed that proclamation. And this slave is going out and celebrate her freedom. Come on, let you and I go get stiff. I'm sorry, Winnie, I can't go. Do I have to draw a diagram for you? You and I going on a party. I'm burning my bridges in hell. Come on. Do me a favor. Find somebody else, will you? You mean you don't want to go? Well, sure I want to go. I'm human. But I've got work to do. These experiments cost money, and if I leave them now... You mean this is more important to you than... Sister? In about 42 minutes, something's going to happen in that gadget that I've been waiting a good many days to see. Bevan, one of us is going to miss an awful lot in life. 
And I'll give anybody four to one. It won't be me. I swear by Apollo, the physician, that I will keep this oath and stipulation. I swear by Apollo, the physician, that I will keep this oath and stipulation. Into whatever houses I enter, I will go for the benefit of the sick and abstain from every voluntary act of mischief and corruption. Into whatever houses I enter, I will go for the benefit of the sick and abstain from every voluntary act of mischief and corruption. With purity and holiness, I will pass my life and practice my art. Should I violate this oath, may I cease to enjoy the privileges thereof and the respect of all men from that time forth, forever. With purity and holiness, I will pass my life and practice my art. Should I violate this oath, May I cease to enjoy the privileges thereof and the respect of all men from that time forth forever. How do you feel, Doctor? Never better, Doctor. And you, Doctor? Fine, Doctor. Your college is happy today to welcome home one of its most distinguished alumni. A few minutes ago, it conferred on him the degree of Doctor of Science. I ask him now to start you on your careers with his advice and counsel. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. William Cunningham. You know, when you gentlemen were getting your diplomas just now, I was sitting back and thinking how fortunate I was when I got mine. Forty odd years ago, doctors didn't have to know so much there wasn't so much for them to know. And possibly it's just as well. Maybe some of us would never have become doctors. <laughs> but taken all in all, the job we've done hasn't been a bad one. I think, for the most part, that's been due to a power greater than our own. You will learn something of that power sooner or later when your hearts are ready to receive it. In the years you've been here, your minds are all you've had to use. You have worshipped at one shrine, science, and that is as it should be. But now you will need to use your hearts, and through them, you will find an even holier shrine. In the suffering and agony you'll encounter, you will learn love of your fellow man. You will need to delve into a part of man no anatomist has ever found, his soul. The fellow's not a doctor, he's a missionary. And a dull one at that. For I charge you, you cannot cure the ills of a body and leave a soul in torment. This is all that 40 years has taught me. And for what it's worth, I pass it on to you. There remains the awarding of one special appointment. I will ask Dr. Forster to do that. I'm sure you will realize that the warm atmosphere of brotherly love engendered here by my colleague has nothing to do with the appointment I'm about to make. It is made purely in the interest of scientific research. I'm going to ask Brother John Wesley Bevan to hold forth in my laboratory during the coming year. This should prove that these appointments are based neither on uh, personal congeniality nor, of course, individual preference. Do you accept the appointment, Brother Bevan? I'd be delighted, Dr. Forster. Like you, I recognize that the ship is more important than the crew.
Well, I'll say one thing for you. You're consistent. You started on his throat and you're still hanging on. This concludes the ceremony. Bill, I'm so proud of you. But I'm afraid some of these students have not the wisdom to profit by your words. Why should they listen to an old duffer like me? Come on, let's have some tea. You will answer as your names are called. Lawrence Carpenter. Here. Oh, yes. Yes, of course, Mr. Carpenter. We are honored to have the heir to the Carpenter millions in our midst. I have already been informed, sir, that if, uh, by some miracle, you are able to graduate from this institution, we may, in all fairness, expect a substantial endowment. Unfortunately, I do not consider even that a sufficient reward for letting a potential murderer loose upon an unsuspecting world. Sit down. Some bone wax, hurry. Bone wax? Get some, I said. Get some bone wax, quick. As you look around, you will see some empty places. For the good of the university and the world at large, 14 members of this class are no longer with us. It's very possible that a good many of you who remain will soon join them. I mention this so you won't think you have nothing more to worry about. I'd rather have Tubby any day. He wasn't as tough as this egg. Oh, it's you, Carpenter. Wanted to see me? That's right. Then make an appointment with my secretary. I'm busy now. You're not too busy for this. I'll tell you. Get out. What have I got to lose? You bounced me, didn't you? You were incompetent. And lazy. That's what you say. What I say goes. No, no, it doesn't. Not now. You're late for me, Tubby. You decided you'd get me that very first day. Right then, I decided to bash your face in when you did. Now, how will you take it? Standing up or sitting down? Young man. I'm 30 years older than you are, but... Ow! I know it's none of my business, but these kids are squawking. They'll take it from Tubby because he is Tubby, but they won't take it from you. You're too rough on them. What do they want me to do? Hold their hands and tell them how wonderful they are? Nobody ever held mine, or yours either. Look, fella, these kids aren't scientific experiments. They're human beings who've come here to study. Well, then let them study and stop their grousing. There isn't time for both. Keep out of this. <laughs> Will you perform the autopsy or shall I? Get him out of here. I'll put him in the ice box. Take him down to the dispensary and keep your trap shut. Steady now. I want this thing kept quiet. Naturally. We never do to let on that the great Dr. Foster got his ears beaten off. What do you mean by that remark? Well, it'd be bad for the morale. It might give other students ideas. Nauseated? A little. You want to throw up or lie down, or both? I'll just sit down. Fortunately for me, you arrived. The fellow would have killed me. Probably. That's why I stopped him. Do you have to do that? Must cleanse the wound thoroughly. You taught me that, Doctor. So he was trying to get even with you, eh? Yes. Yeah, took me by surprise. Shouldn't have. You've had a good licking coming to you for a long time. If you don't mind my saying so. 
Perhaps you'd like to give me one yourself. That's putting it mildly. Then why did you interfere? So happens there's still a lot of things you know that I don't. I've got to get them out of you. That's the most cold-blooded remark that was ever made by one man to another in the history of the world. Knowing how you despise sentimentality, sir, I am flattered. Fortunately, I have a use for you also. I got a case coming in here tomorrow, a repair job. The patient suffered a bullet wound in the right arm about two years ago. Penetrated the medial aspect of the arm with seemingly no impairment of function. Understand? Mm hmm Medial nerve. Yeah, a few months later, they developed a pain. In the hand, none in the arm. The operation was performed, but gave no relief. What did he do? Liberate the adhesions without uniting the nerve? Hmm. Apparently. As a result, the hand now is so sensitive that the, the pain is almost unendurable. It sounds to me as though the nerve fibers had grown out, producing a new aroma. Good, very good. You'll operate at 10 o'clock. Me? Why not? Afraid you can't do it? Not at all. I was only surprised that you'd be willing to step aside. Well, do you never get it through that thick skull of yours that I'm interested only in one thing, good surgery? I don't care who does it. I'm obviously... Well, I cannot do it myself. the young man who has no use for missionaries. I beg your pardon. I, I wasn't expecting to see. Where is Dr. Forster? Dr. Cunningham told me he would operate. Yes, he was to, but unfortunately he... Oh, I see. It is you who will operate? With your permission, of course. Dr. Forster didn't tell me that... I mean, a bullet wound. I thought perhaps some gangster. We are only using local anesthetic, doctor. You needn't talk your patient into unconsciousness. You are in good hands, Miss Hilton. I explained to Dr. Cunningham about my uh, automobile accident. I am sorry. Please do not think me difficult. It is quite all right. Then we'll proceed. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Bevan. How's the hand? The hand is much better, but the arm is very painful. That's fine, just as it should be. I'm glad it pleases you. I myself am not delighted. Won't you sit down? No, thank you, Miss Hilton. I'm afraid I haven't time to visit. But the pain. You have not told me why. You can ring if you need me, Doctor. Well, briefly, your arm is hurting because of the operation. It's the wound that hurts. But your hand is better because we've removed the tumor from the nerve. Oh, I see. The bullet almost severed the nerve. You, you must have suffered terribly. Yes. There are many Chinese suffering from wounds these days. Chinese? I am Chinese. Did you not know? But your name, your, your face, oh, you're joking. On the contrary, doctor. My name, my face, they do not matter. It is inside that a person is what he is. I was born in China, educated in China, did not leave China until a year ago. Yes, I am Chinese. But even so, your parents... I never knew my parents. My foster parents, they were Chinese. They're the only family I ever knew. That's the most extraordinary thing I ever heard. Oh, let me look at this. Yes, this will do. I'm having a Bradford frame big for you. Make you a little more comfortable. Have one of the interns help you. Yes, doctor. I'll, I'll look in tomorrow. 
Thank you so much. I'm very grateful. I, I hope you'll feel better. Good day. Good day. Well, Miss Hilton, I have to hand it to you. You've made history in this hospital. Why? A man and boy, I've known John Bevan for five years. And this is the first indication I've ever had that he was a human being. Sitting down and chatting with a patient. Believe me, there ought to be a bronze plaque on that chair. And in a week, you'll be right as rain. You'll be playing golf in a month. Another American custom I have not yet acquired. You mustn't turn down our American sports. Oh, I have already succumbed to fishing. Dr. Cunningham taught me. Fishing? Say, I used to be the best hook and worm fisherman in the whole state of Wisconsin. You know, when you talk about fishing, you're quite a different person. How do you mean? Well, for a little minute, you're not the stern Dr. Bevan. Tell me, how long is it since you went fishing? Oh, it's been years. Not since I came here. I haven't had time. I think it will be a great relief to you when my arm is better and I can go home. You regret even these few minutes that keep you from your work. But this is my work, part of it. Besides, I've enjoyed... Dr. Bevan is wanted in Dr. Forrester's office. Dr. Bevan is wanted in Dr. Forrester's office. There, you see, it's just the reverse. It's my work that takes me from you. You wanted to see me, doctor? Yes. I'm scheduled to perform an operation at 10 tomorrow morning at Centerport. Yes, I know. Accident case. That's right. I find I can't get away, and the patient's too ill to be moved. You'll have to start immediately. I can't leave here now. I've got work to do, patients to look after. I'm familiar with the work you have to do, Dr. Bevan. There's nothing you can't leave. That's all. It's all over now, Johnny. This is Dr. Bevan who operated on you. When I get well, Doc, I can go back to work again, can't I? Now, don't worry about that now. I want you to rest. Oh, but I got it. Gee, Doc, my, my old man will kill me. You do as I tell you. Honest, you don't know him. I'd rather die than... Shh. You heard what the doctor said. Be a good boy. Well, how's the kid? Are you his father? Yeah. I will recover, but I can only help one leg. The other one's paralyzed. You mean he'll be a cripple? Yes. Well, that's what he gets for hopping cars instead of staying on the job. A cripple. Yeah, that ain't just my luck. Your luck? You ought to be glad he's alive at all. Well, sure I am, Doc, but what good will he be now? Two cents, I'd... See if this man's kept out of here. I don't want him talking to the patient. You're leaving, Doctor? The boy's out of danger. There's nothing more for me to do. Oh, Bevan. Dr. Bevan. Hello, Doctor. Just heard you were in town. Hope to catch you before you left. Say, that operation you did on Miss Hilton's arm was a honey. Thanks. I'm glad it turned out all right. Dr. Bevan, I have a call for you from Dr. Forster's. All right, I'll take it here. But what I dropped in for was to see if you couldn't come up to the lake for a little fishing. The bass are biting now, and I hear you rather fancy yourself <laughs> as a... Well, that's very kind of you, Doctor, but I've got to get right back. Got several important cases. Here's Dr. Forster's. Thanks. Sorry, Doctor. I'm sorry, too. Audrey will be awfully disappointed. She hoped to see you at the lake. Miss Hilton? Yes. But she's still in the hospital. No, Tubby sent her home yesterday. Oh, he did, eh? Come on. What do we use for bait? For Dr. Bevan. What do I tell Dr. Forster? Tell him I've gone fishing. Hello, Dr. Forster. Yes, this is Centerport Hospital. I'm sorry, but Dr. Bevan just left. Yes, sir, I told him. 
What did he say? He just said he was going fishing. If every man would stick to his own field, the world would be better off. Take Miss Hilton's case, for instance. The mistake was made. Mind you, Bob. Uh, just playing around. Better have a look at your bait. She's a very interesting girl, don't you think? Very. No, he didn't get it. Did she tell you anything of her background? You mean about China? She's no more Chinese than my aunt Minnie. Son, you're American. If you've been born in France, lost your parents when you were three or four weeks old, been taken in by French friends of theirs and treated as their own, learned French as your native language, never left the country until you'd grown up, how would you think of yourself? Yes, but that's different. Not a bit. She thinks of herself as Chinese. That makes her Chinese. Well, it's not the same. Say what you will, it's a difference in race. Would she... Would she marry a Chinese, for instance? Well, you can't tell. But I don't think so. But don't you think that... Wait, I got a bite. Mm. Dr. Bevan! I just received a telegram. Tell her to go away. Dr. Forster says you must return at once. I suppose there's more real satisfaction in landing a beautiful bass than any... Oh. You know, I, I haven't thanked you. Thank me for what? For getting Dr. Cunningham to ask me up here. I was surprised when you came, though. I did not think you would leave your hospital. Look here, you think I'm a regular automaton, don't you? I think you may become one. I'm not. Not actually. If there's a wall around me, I build it there deliberately. Did you, or was it Tubby put it there? He started it. The first day when I came to him. I was just the average kid that wanted to be a doctor. And then I saw him work. And I thought I'd never seen anything so beautiful in my life. And you decided to be like him? Not just then. You see, he, he talked to us. Told us what being a real scientist meant. That, that there could be no room in life for anything but work. Well, I suppose there were a hundred men in that room, but it seemed to me he was talking for my benefit alone. And right then I, I swore that nothing would ever interfere. That explains so much. You mean why? Why we were drawn together. I too have a wall but not of my own choosing. That is why we can be friends. Audrey. Yes? What you said just now about our, our being drawn together. I should not have said that. I'm glad you said it. It means so much. Audrey. Yes? I know I've no right to ask it. Oh, you may ask anything. You wouldn't mind? Sorry. Why? It only makes it more difficult. You will soon forget. But I don't want to forget. You will, though. You will forget because you are seeking to avoid life. I shall remember because I'm lonely and seeking to enter into it. Are you always this frank? Is it wrong? Well, to me, you can say anything you like, but other men might misunderstand. Oh, you are not like other men. No, I'm just a freak, Audrey. In some ways, I'm just a plain fool. I'm so glad to hear you say that. Are you? Why? It is so oriental. In China, people always speak humbly of themselves. And you think by accepting the unworthy friendship of a miserable doctor that you might feel less lonely? Oh, I'm sure of it. Provided the honorable friend of Lan Ying would not find her a nuisance. Lan Ying? That is my Chinese name. Sometimes I get so hungry to hear the sound of it. Mind you. Mind you. Please, it must not happen again. And you will go back to your world, and I to mine. But we shall be friends forever. Is it not so? I hope so, with all my heart. Audrey! 
Audrey! Let him alone. I can't. It's important. Not as important as that. I don't know if you children realize it, but it's 10 o'clock. Audrey's going to miss her train. Train? I will get my coat. I didn't know she was leaving. She's always leaving. For Cleveland, New York, Washington. What for? Something to do with China. It's all Chinese to me. Goodbye, dear. Goodbye. Yes, sir. Vienna was a great city in the 90s. We had a lot of fun together in those days, Tubby and I. Can't imagine Tubby being much fun. Tubby? Hmm. He was the happy-go-luckiest young fellow you ever met. Until Elsa died. Elsa? Who was she? The girl he was engaged to. Tubby engaged? Sure. Knocked him all to pieces when she died. Nothing but a bad appendix. But some fool doctor didn't diagnose it in time. That's what made Tubby throw up everything and come to America. You ready? Yeah. Tubby in love. I didn't think he could be so human. You don't suppose people are born that way, do you? I never knew a man to shut himself off from life without a reason. It's a good nature. What time do you want to leave tomorrow? Hmm? Oh, as early as possible. I can drive you as far as Centerport. I'm going that way. Thanks. Say, we might look in on that kid I operated on. He needs help. Your kind of help. You might just think of something. Glad to. Good night. Good night. Come in. Oh, you're back. Yes, sir. Hope you enjoyed your vacation. Did you catch any fish? Several, thanks. I'm surprised that a great humanitarian like Cunningham would indulge in such a cruel pastime. Or does he draw the line at the sole of a pickerel? I don't know, sir. We were fishing for bass. Now that you've had your outing, you might get around to reporting on that case at Centerport. I have it here. Successful? Yes, except that the patient will never walk. That was not to be expected. I spoke to Jeffers about finding him a job in the hospital. Why? What business is that of yours? None. I just felt like doing it. Just felt like doing it? You mean you talked it over with Cunningham, and he impressed upon your mushy mind the notion that social uplift is more important than surgery? As a matter of fact, I did mention yes, it. Yes, I thought so. Well, it may interest you to know that we are to have the benefit of his noble influence, too. He's just been asked to lecture here for the next term. Yes, I know. He told me. If you don't mind, I have a class waiting. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Feed them on milk and water. Tell them what noble little knights they are. Yeah, soften them up for Cunningham. Tell them all to be doers of good deeds and rotten doctors. Cunningham's methods are his own affair. You'll find my classes conducted as they should be. When they're not, you can always have me fired. Regardless of what your experience may be in the rest of the college, in any classes conducted by Dr. Forster or myself, nothing but the strictest scientific attitude will be tolerated. For your own good, I advise you to remember that. No rises, your names are called. Andrew Abbott. That is I, sir. I hardly expected an Oriental to answer to the name of Abbott. When I came to America, I found my real name was difficult for my new friends to speak. So, I changed it. How did you happen to choose Abbott? Uh, in this country, I observed that students are frequently seated alphabetically, which places the A's near the teacher. Not generally considered to be an advantage. Uh, uh, the Chinese eye, uh, Professor, is often myopic. Uh, we like to be close to the desk, especially when uh, experiments are demonstrated. Uh, also, uh, when called upon first, the foreigner will usually be pardoned if he commits a blunder. But uh, if he's asked the question after many of his classmates has failed, the professor, by that time, is, is so peeved that he... <laughs> I've often heard of the wisdom of the East. 
but never realized to what practical purposes it could be put. Hereafter, Mr. Abbott, you may sit in the front row and claim all the penalties and privileges thereto pertaining. Thank you so much. Hello? Oh, hello. Yes? Yes. There's something wrong? No, no, nothing, except I want to see you. Dr. Cunningham says you're going away again. Yes, I know, but I've been thinking. Audrey, I... I have to talk to you. You cannot leave? Well, the hospital's pretty full. I don't know when... Would you like me to come to you? I could stop off on my way to New York, if that would suit you. Nothing could suit me better. Hello? Oh, yes, this is Bevan. Yes, yes, that's quite correct. All right, phone me again if there's any change. Anything wrong? The dinner isn't spoiled. The dinner will be excellent if the professor's nerves will permit him to eat it. You know, you're doing me a great favor, Abbott. I, I haven't attempted to thank you. It is a pleasure. I only hope the cooking will remind the lady of China. How did you know I was a lady? The Chinese eye is my optic, Professor, but uh, not blind. You do not like the way I look? You look beautiful. You'll forgive my surprise. Since you are the person with whom I'm most comfortable, I wanted to dress in the clothes in which I am most myself. Why shouldn't you? I'm delighted. You don't know what it means to me to have you here. I had two reasons for coming. I wanted to see where you live. It's very simple. But very neat, very masculine. Tell me, have you no animal to keep you company? No dog? Cat? Bird? I spend most of my time at the hospital. Your mother? Yes. You are like her, are you not? I don't know. Dinner is served, sir. You did not tell me you had a Chinese man. <laughs> One surprise deserves another. Shall we go in? How charming. This is a most kindly thought to have a Chinese dinner. Thank you. You treat your guests very well. If I did not know you, I would think you entertained a great deal. Do you like the soup? It tastes like orange. Is it all right? It is perfect. I have not had any since I left home. Ni ju di chai hun hao. Oh, bu hao, bu hao. Forgive me. I just told him how delicious it is. I know that pleased him. Tell me, where did you find him? He has the accent of a cultivated gentleman. Ask him if he minds my telling you. Ta jai nao li, jiao dao ni di. Rang ta gao su wa, hao ma. Howdy. If the professor wishes. He's one of my students. Very kindly volunteered to serve dinner for me. Ni Chung Nao Lai Di. Kyung Su Sing Lai Di. But it wasn't until I heard Tubby's story, what made him what he is, that I realized what a fool I'd been. There's no conflict between science and, and life. See, it was Tubby's bitterness that deceived me. He was just trying to alibi his own frustration. I see that now. Thanks to you. 
I'm glad you feel more kindly toward the world. And not the world, Audrey. I'm thinking of us. You have been thinking of others, too. Dr. Cunningham told me, that boy at Centerport. Audrey, don't you see, dear, that's all you're doing. Six months ago, I wouldn't have bothered my head about that boy. But you would, if you had known. Yes, if I'd known you and been in love. Do not say that. I do not. I must say it. I've been in love with you since the first day I saw you. I fought against it at the start, and, and then quite suddenly I, I knew that was my salvation. I love you, Lan Ying, here in my home. I want you here always. I want to marry you. But it cannot be. You must realize that you are of the West and I of the East. You're a woman, the woman I love, and I'm a man. A man who loves you, east or west, that's all that matters. No, no, Jack. We said... We said lots of things. Silly things. Please wait. I must have a chance to think. What is it I think about? Remember I once told you... I, too, had a war that kept me from you. What sort of war? A promise, a solemn promise that is not yet fulfilled. But what is it? If you'd only tell me that... That I cannot do. It is my own problem that I have to work out by myself. How long will it... Yes. Yes, this is Bevan. Hmm? What's the blood count? Yes, yes, I know. All right, get the operating room ready and call Jackson. I'll be there in 15 minutes. You see what our life would be. It is not that which interferes. Well, what is it, then? There is work for you to do. You must go. Will you wait for me? No, I must take my train. But I should like to stay here until there's time to go. When will you let me know? As soon as I know. But one promise I will give you. If ever I do come back here, it shall be to stay. Goodbye. For a little while? Yes. I hope for a little while. There's a Miss Hilton to see you, Excellency. You are sure she asked to be announced as Miss Hilton? Yes, Excellency. Then show Miss Hilton in. The ambassador will see you, Miss Hilton. It is good of you to see me so quickly, Excellency. I'm happy to express my gratitude to the daughter of Sang Ling for her great accomplishment. You mean it has been successful? Yes, the loan we needed so desperately is being granted. Sang Ling would have been very proud of you. You make it very difficult for me to ask the question that has brought me here. It need not be. Yes. Because it has to do with Sen Ling. It brings back the picture of how I last saw him after Shanghai had been destroyed. It took me three days to reach our home. I walked into the garden that had once been so beautiful, where we had been so happy. But there was no garden anymore. Only gaping holes, bleeding wounds in the earth itself. So it is with all China. And in the doorway I found him or what was left of him. As I stood there, I took a vow that so long as I had life, that life should be devoted to repaying the debt that I owed him. And now I come to you to ask you if my debt has been discharged. I must know that I have fulfilled my vow. I knew that you had when you were announced as Miss Hilton. When you call yourself lying, it was because you thought of yourself 
as Chinese, but now by calling yourself Miss Hilton, it means you have realized that you are American. Yes, that is true for the first time. And that is as it should be. I hope he is a very nice young man. How did you know? What else could call you back where you belong? Yes, I suppose. And he is a very nice young man. Dr. Cunningham. Uh, hello there. I was over at the college looking for you. I just got a wire from Audrey. She'll be here tomorrow night. I want you and Mrs. Cunningham to have dinner with us. By all means, but you come down to the hotel and dine with us. Now, this is going to be a real celebration. At least I hope so. She promised that if she ever came back, it'd be for good. My dear boy, congratulations. That's splendid. Just what we've been hoping to hear. Thanks. Well, I'll, I'll see you later. Just, just puttering around. Always wanted to dabble with chemistry. Never had time. You're getting old. I recognize the symptoms. I have them myself. You mind if I smoke in here? Go ahead. Go ahead. You're going to break down all the rules of the place anyhow. I hope so. Rules are no good. They're just made to make things easier for us. Yeah. Seen Bevan today? Yeah, I saw him this afternoon. Well, that boy's very fond of you. Bevan? You're out of your mind. He isn't fond of anyone. Doesn't know what emotion is. And besides, I... Say, suppose you let me and Bevan alone. We're getting along very well. You're very fond of him, too. He's got promise. Great promise. If nothing happens to hold him back. Nothing will hold him back. That's what I wanted to make sure of. It'd be a bitter blow to him if you turned against him. Speak plainly. Will you stop beating about the bush? He's going to be married. Married? So that's it. I knew he'd been seeing the girl, but I had no idea he'd be such a stupid, short-sighted... Wait, wait, wait a bit. No, I know, I know. You think it's wonderful? Yes. Yes. What difference does it make if the world has one more half-baked surgeon so long as he's happy? That boy needs five more years of training. Well, what makes you think he won't get it? For a wife. He'll be out grabbing for money like the rest of them. A man who might have... might have stood for something. You're entirely wrong about Babbitt. He'll work harder than ever. You know, a man doesn't always get a chance at real happiness. We know that. Don't we, you, Bill? Roommate 27. Oh, Miss Hilton, there's a gentleman here to see you. For me? Where is he? Here he is. Miss Hilton, I, uh... I've been waiting to... Nothing is wrong. Dr. Bevan is all right. Oh, yes, he's quite all right. But uh, I wanted to see you about... Perhaps you will have uh, tea with me. We can talk more quietly. Yes, if you wish. No, thank you. Miss Hilton? I'm not a diplomat. I have never heard you accused of being one. Quite so. Then, since you know my reputation, I... Uh, I hope I may be frank with you. If you will grant me the same privilege, Dr. Forster. Yes, yes, agreed. I understand you plan to marry Dr. Bevan. Yes. Yes, that is so. And you 
realize, I suppose, that you are ruining a brilliant career. Possibly one of the greatest I'm doing nothing of the sort, Dr. Forster. I know your theories. So does he. We do not believe them. I wish you could believe me. I will not hurt him nor his career. Would you believe me if I told you that you had already hurt him? But that is not true. How could I? In the only way that matters. In his work. It has fallen off miserably. I do not see why. There is no reason. There is every reason. No man can concentrate properly when his mind is beset with doubts and anxieties. Doubts? He has no doubts now. Think, Miss Hilton. If you, quite suddenly, threw into the discard every plan you'd ever made, isn't it possible Forgive that you Forgive me, Doctor. But there is no reason why, because he fell in love with me... Oh, well, there is. There is, Miss Hilton. Here is a man who chose a path for himself because he saw it would lead to... to a definite goal. Now, if you were in his position and abandoned that path, wouldn't you be worried? Fearful that you had done the wrong thing. Yes. That I can understand. I myself have... Oh, but that does not matter. It is only Jack who must course, not be... Of uh... course, I don't want to influence you. The decision must be yours. And his. Yours only. He has made two promises. One to himself, the other to you. And he will break the first before he breaks the second, for he thinks then he only hurts himself. Yes. Yes, I know that. All right, thanks very much. She checked into the hotel all right and then checked out an hour later. That's not like Audrey. She'd have called. There, there, Mother. She probably went to another hotel. She said she'd come here and she will. I should have met the train. Tubby gave me such a stack of work that... It's after eight, she said... There she is now. Kevin? Yes? Not bad news. We must follow our separate paths. You toward your goal, I toward mine. Goodbye. Sign Lan Ying. Bevan, what in thunder's the matter with you? What is it you want? I want you to get hold of yourself. For all the use you are in this hospital, you might as well be in Timbuktu. Moping around like a sick calf, I'm getting fed up. Tell me what you want done and I'll do it. That's what I'm here for. But I don't have to listen to any of you. Oh, you don't? Hearing plain facts is a little too strong for you, is it? I thought once you had backbone. I was wrong. Well, but that's impossible. You couldn't make a mistake. I made one. In you, I admit it. Called by the Dr. Bevan, the true scientist. Look at yourself now. A sniveling pup. Afraid to face life. By heaven, that girl had more stuff in girl. her than... What girl? What girl? What girl? What girl do you suppose? You might as well have married her for all the... Did you talk to her? Take your hands off me. Tell me while you've got the chance. Did you get her to go away? Yes, 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 I talked to her. And she had more sense than you. She saw how silly the whole thing was. Swine, you cold-blooded little swine. You could do that. You could take two people's lives and tear them apart like, like guinea pigs. Cut them up into little bits just to see them suffer. And you talk about backbone. Why, you spineless little hypocrite, do you think you're fooling me? You'd have been married now if you'd had a chance. But your girl died, didn't she? And just because you can't be happy, you don't want anybody else to be happy. That's why you sit in your little throne and try to play God. That's not true. I did what was best for you. You're throwing away your life. That's a lie. With her, I'll be everything I ever wanted to be. And a better scientist than you. Because I'll know something you'll never know. 
I don't know what's inside of people besides bones and nerves. I'll know the thing inside of them that really matters. Come back here, I'm not through with you. Well, that's too bad, Tubby, because I'm through with you for good. I've been your stooge long enough. I've taken your abuse, I've done your dirty work. But now I'm free, and I'm clearing out of here. Well, I'm... And where do you think you're going? Where do you think? I don't want to sound discouraging, Doctor, but I'm afraid you're starting on a wild goose chase. No particular reason? Yes. These are war times. All means of communication with the interior are destroyed. So I understand. It may take you weeks to reach the nearest government lines. And even if you get there, the girl you're looking for may be hundreds of miles farther on. I have nothing better to do than to find her. But, Doctor, I don't think you realize the danger. Lan Ying went through, didn't she? They fly often into the west. By night, we reach Shenton. We stop there. Just long enough to feed the horses. <laughs> this is Shenton, sir. Yeah, what's left of it. Pardon my amazement, monsieur. I did not expect to see a white man. And I get food for my horses? And for yourself, too, monsieur. The hospital is at your disposal. Hospital? Where's the doctor? Permit me, monsieur. Such as I am, I am the doctor. My name is Laferriere. I beg your pardon. I didn't realize it. Have you got it set? After a fashion, yes. If you care to have me look at it, I'm a doctor. Doctor, this is God's mercy. I have so many. If you would stay. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I haven't time. I must push on. Oh, I beg your pardon. I had no right to ask. But uh, why they feed the horses? There is a child. If you would help with her. All right, let's have a look. I, uh... This way, please. broken in four places. <laughs> it's 
Send someone out to my guide. Tell him to unsaddle the horses. Thank you. She says, if the gods are willing to send good men to help her, why must they send other men to hurt her? That's a little difficult to explain. You must get some rest, doctor. You've been operating for six hours alone. I'm all right. Don't worry now, sister. We're not going to hurt you this time. Just want to get your legs straight. Wish I could make them understand. Your tone, monsieur, reassures them as much as words could. I'm very much interested in your technique, monsieur. In all my life, I have known only one man who uses instruments as you do. Really? Mm -hmm. The great Dr. Foster. You knew the old grouch? I had that privilege. Once he conducted a course at the Sorbonne. I used to be his assistant. Monsieur, you are jesting. <laughs> no jesting, not with Tubby. <laughs> Return. Go go they won't bomb here again, will they? I'm afraid they will. They're trying to destroy a munition dump. For you, Doctor. Mm -hmm. Miss Ray. Miss Ray. Yes, Doctor. Find out where Shantin is in China and the quickest way to get there. Yes, Doctor.
Do you agree with my diagnosis, Doctor? Yes. Yes, of course, of course, it's... it's obvious. Get surgery ready. I'll operate. Surely you are not serious, Monsieur? Such an operation, even under the best conditions... He'll die if I don't operate, won't he? Yes, that is true. But... Well? You pay Sasho. I'm hoping the transfusion won't be necessary. Yes, of course. Yes, Doctor, but you must understand that under these conditions... Yes, yes, I know. This must not go wrong. Transfusion. Still hope he holds his own. He should have begun to rally. With that pressure lifted, by this time, I don't understand it. Shh. 
You must not harass yourself, monsieur. You operated under tremendous difficulties. In your own surgery with good equipment That's and... That's got nothing to do with it. The operation couldn't have been more successful no matter where it was performed. Whatever these hands can do, they have done. There's nothing more they can do now. He lies there and... and with all my skill, I... It's true. All that science can do, it has been done. Nothing can help him now except himself. What can he do? He has never come out of the coma. I think I know what Dr. Ling means. There comes a time when we are helpless, we men of medicine, when nothing can help except something inside the patient, something we call the will to live. There were but some way to, to strike a spark within him. No, that's rubbish. If you are talking about some mystic power, then I... No, no, no. I speak of nothing strange, monsieur. I speak only of his soul. Nagosilan <laughs> Any change? It's the planes again. We cannot move it. It comes from the west. It's a Chinese plane. It is landing. Jack, darling. I am here. I am here to stay. Don't leave me now. You must not leave me now. Can you hear me, darling? only a little way.
There is nothing you can do. You... You should get some rest. I will stay. He may waken again. Forgive me. Either of you. But what I did, I thought. I thought was for the best. I wanted him to be as great as. as I knew he could be. Please believe that. I thought I had given him the greatest strength any man could know. Science. But I've seen something. Something even greater. I guess you could call it a miracle. 